Uh, by, <laughs> by saying a quick word on the Quebec office in the, uh, the Atlantic provinces, we've been here for 40 years, but we have an economic mandate for two years now. We have two persons dedicated to accompanying uh, the enterprises in uh, doing business, um, uh, be it in Quebec or in the Atlantic uh, provinces. So one of those two persons is Pierre Martin that has been working on this activity with Anne-Sophie at Investment Quebec. And I would like to thank both of them for this, uh, this event this morning. Um, and at the end, I mean, like we have, as I said, we have a tight schedule. So if you have any questions uh, for the companies or with regard to our services, um, feel free to send us an email or to, to post your question in the chat. Uh, section, our uh, our team here will follow up on that. Uh, culture is very important. It's important in Quebec and in, at, in the Atlantic provinces. In Canada, I read yesterday that this, the cultural sector generated $56.1 billion uh, in GDP, uh, as I said, in 2018. And it was responsible for 655,000 jobs um, in Canada. So that's, that's saying how important it is. Only in New Brunswick, the cultural sector is the second in importance uh, after the oil sector, which is also an interesting uh, fact here. And then another thing interesting is that culture is the source of our progress and creativity in our societies. It must be carefully uh, nurtured and in order uh, for it to grow and develop. And that is not me saying it's UNESCO. So this is a very important sector that uh, we have to, uh, to, to, to consider and to, to give the importance that it should receive. Uh, so as I said, we have four uh, companies this morning, uh, and we have more than 20 institutions that are participating. Um, and we'll start right now with the first part of this session. So the first part, um, each of the companies will have a, a, a three minute to, to, to give you an idea of what they're doing. And I'm starting with uh, Caroline Julien, founder and uh, head of Creo, an enterprise, is, an enterprise that encourages learning through interactive uh, experiences. Caroline. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to, uh, to be here today. Uh, so Creo, in, uh, so, uh, Creo is a Montreal-based um, uh, communication agency and a production studio. For 19 years, uh, we have been working with museum and science centers uh, from Canada and Europe. Our job is to inform, captivate, and mobilize uh, your audiences uh, in an innovative way. Um, to do this, we create a memorable experience that make you want to learn. Uh, so we use uh, playful and technological approaches to reach uh, the new audiences, place visitors in a very active posture. We like to combine um, knowledge and game to spark the curiosity. Our strengths is three ingredients that make us stand out. First, the content. Uh, we're pretty strong to popularize knowledge with rigor and skills. We have uh, commun scientific communicators in our team, such as uh, Michel Grou, for example, who have been in Montreal, the science, uh, Mu Montreal Science Center as a chief content for um, almost uh, uh, 18 years. Um, so the most com complex concept uh, become accessible to variety public schools, uh, families, and millennials. Second, our creativity to captivate, we co-create playful, relevant, memorable experiences. Depending on your need, uh, we create educational programs, digital books, Serious games, exhibition, immersive experiences. And third, production to mobilize. We co-create innovative, interactive digital devices, which are entertaining. We're quite versatile to deploy in space or range of techno technological means, such as interactive walls, connected objects, uh, multiplayer touch screens, playful, interactive projections, sound players, VR devices. So um, one of our projects uh, in Grenoble, we are in charge of uh, the development of the permanent exhibition of a new planetarium uh, and science center for uh, Rhône-Alpes um, Metropole. 
very happy to be here today. Thanks, Caroline. So you did, uh, I would say, two minutes and a half. So that's perfect. Thanks. <laughs> I will uh, keep on going with Yannick Doné, CEO and producer at Allo Creation, an enterprise and a company that is that specialize in the production of uh, immersive and interactive installations. Yannick. Thank you, Maud André. Uh, good morning, everyone. First and foremost, thank you for uh, sparing some time to meet us to, uh, this morning. Uh, I'm very happy to um, meet you, even though I don't see you guys, but hopefully I'll get to meet you uh, in person in a very short time. Uh, I'm the CEO and producer at Auto Creation. We are a Montreal-based multimedia and production studio. We are mostly focused on immersive and interactive multimedia experiences. Uh, basically, we are content creators and storytellers, and we put people at the art of the multimedia experience. Uh, in short, we help you promote your content and your brand by creating multimedia, uh, exciting multimedia experiences in order to reach your audience. Well, I have a, a wonderful team that is passionate about humanity, art, and technology. We work in the different sectors, which is culture, tourism, and corporate communications. We are basically creatives, creatives and solvers who optimize each step of the process. And for us, there are three very important things in our relationship with uh, people we work with. First, we work with you. Uh, we build long-term relationships, so it's all based on communication and uh, harmony. And we support you from the start and afterwards. Um, it's very important for us to uh, be there uh, the soonest in the process and also once the project is delivered we stay there in order to get the feedback support you help you out if there's anything uh, happening with the content or the technology or whatsoever and that's it i'm taking a bit less time but i'll have more to say later on thank you Thanks, Yannick. Um, I'll follow up with Madame uh, Isabel Lopez, founder and CEO of MySmart uh, Journey, an, ent an enterprise that provides solutions to share and collect information and data. Uh, Isabel. Hi, nice to meet you, everyone. I, I can relate to what Yannick said because I did work with him. Uh, and they are awesome. And I'm um, looking forward to work with Manu and Caroline because we are a pure technology company. You have to understand that we are, we don't do content and the content is all yours. So it's mostly systems to actually have uh, interactive uh, 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 signage that will have a QR code, NFC and short links. There are different ones. We did work for more about a hundred projects now. We are a mature uh, technology. I'm gonna share my screen. I do know I still have two minutes, so I'm gonna enjoy it. Uh, so we are the simplest technology uh, to share, to deploy contactless interactive multimedia contents in a public space like a museum. How it works is that we have a very clever system that allow you to uh, put the content and connect it to a special signage. It's like a game. It's really easy. You see kids are using it uh, all the time, super easy. And uh, here you can see museum in Sherbrooke, which is a, a museum, in, in, a very small museum in Sherbrooke. And uh, they had a lot of manipulables, you know, touch screens and stuff. So they wanted to change them to into the own device of the visitor. So it would be more hygienic, also less management and uh, still fun. So uh, in less than a week, we were up and running. You have to know in 24 hours, we can be working. At, uh, it works indoor, it works outdoor, even at minus 20. And it's super easy. You put your content. It is, if you know how to attach uh, a file to an email, congratulations, you can use us. We are super, super simple. We do our archivists all the time that use it and say, I'm doing an app for kids, it's so fun. <laughs> so, and uh, so you just deploy the content in the space. You can, if you have a, a temporary exhibition, you move them, move them elsewhere. And it's completely uh, universal. Users never have to download an app. They never have to understand and learn a new way to, to, to get on board. They know how to use it wherever they are in their technology aspect. So uh, we, I, I, I say that we've done more than a uh, hundred projects now. Uh, those are all cultural projects from into shopping malls to museums and uh, outdoor. Uh, so that is, and um, why do we use that? Our KPIs are really joint indicators. 
uh, engagement of visitors is higher. The costs are really cheap, uh, you know, like uh, ongoing, it's a, a few cents per visitor. So it's uh, really affordable. Uh, we do have a, a mission to be, uh, you know, like uh, democratiz democratizing the technology. It takes so much less time. I get calls all the time after a week or two of using us like, oh my God, our team saved so many much time. It's so fun. And we do have data. So why not, you know, how, to, how do your, your visitors behave so that's it. So I give, okay. I will give you more examples of that later. <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Ah, sorry. So thanks, uh, Isabel. Um, now our last but not the least, uh, Manu Al Berola, producer in, at uh, Troublemakers, a, a creative hub that offers immersive and interactive experiences. Manu. Yes, uh, thank you, Maud André. Hi, everyone. My name is Manu Al Berola. I'm a producer and creative director working at Troublemakers. We are a small creative production studio. We're located in Montreal and we focus on uh, providing you with artistic approaches and technological innovations guided by music and sound. And this is for all your interactive, immersive and um, multimedia experiences, whether it's architectural, uh, museums, uh, the, the trendy word edutainment comes to mind. Uh, whether it's amusement park installations, uh, interactive for public spaces, indoors, outdoors. And we also uh, play in the universe of XR uh, experiences, VR, AR, Audio 360, and so on and so forth. Um, I like to say that the sandbox that we play in is creating sound-driven experiences for unconventional formats, which is the new reality that we live in. Uh, and the main takeaway for us is that we favor a boutique approach uh, and for all of our projects, which means assembling a team specifically tailored for the project's need. Every single project has different need and we try to adapt it always accordingly. Um, we can cater internally to a lot of these needs. We have a wonderful team of composers, producers, integrators, sound designers, but we won't hesitate to uh, collaborate externally, uh, going through an extended network of, say, a scenographer, a uh, lighting designer, depending on the types of projects we work on. We thrive on working with local collaborators because they know their the place, they know the public. So we love to adapt it so that it's, it caters to the, the crowd and the public going there. And this is either as a project team or as a lead manager or by integrating into an already assembled team. Uh, a great example of this is with Creo. I didn't even know she was gonna present uh, at this uh, webinar, uh, but we just happened to start working together uh, on one of her projects that I believe she will present. We started this year, we sat down at the table and essentially our role was to help her craft a 360 experience with the audio realm. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. Uh, and I'll get to discuss it a little bit more uh, later on the presentation or the case study. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Manu. So all, uh, all the technologies that we've been discussing are very relevant in this, uh, in this situation that we are in right now, whether it be because we ha we need to have technologies that are uh, touchless or or because there are creative technologies that give us the opportunity to live uh, or to have an experience uh, that that's taking us out of our of the situation we are right now so all of of the presentation are very interesting and very relevant in in the context so thanks uh, to all of you so that leads us to our second part uh, to the second part of our activity today which is kind of a panel uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of activity. And uh, the theme for this, uh, this part is creative technologies for museums, uh, customer experience for visitors, uh, attraction and retention. So I have questions for our speakers. And if you have questions, I'm, and I'm talking to all our guests today, and I think we have more than 20 museums, uh, institutions and organizations that are listening to us. So Feel free to to write them on the chat. I'll try to to pick some of them if 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 we have time. So I'll first uh, go with uh, the first question that we have is why should museums and parks adopt creative technologies? And I will start uh, by the one we ended with. So Manu, would you like to answer this question? There's there's like a short and a long version of this answers uh, of this answer or this, of this question. I'll go with the short one because there's a demand. 
for it from the public. Uh, I think you now nowadays you expect to have a little bit of tech, innovative integration when as a visitor, whenever you go to a museum, with, whenever you go to a science center, whenever you go to an institution that caters to knowledge, shares it, exhibits it in some form of another from typical, you know, art to more uh, historical uh, and so on and so forth. I think there's a demand. And if, Personally, as a consumer, I'll, I'm looking for it whenever I enter a building. So that, that's my short answer. Thanks, Manu. And maybe Isabelle, would you like to comment on that too? Yeah, uh, museums have a mission to open the mind and the heart sometimes. So I think it's just another way somehow to reach out different public, different points of view, uh, you know, even an old exhibition can be revived by just whipping out a new layer of uh, like uh, experience and information. So I, I really, really believe in that. Thanks, thanks. We all we often see like museum as very traditional, but it, there's room for for innovation and new technologies. Thanks. Um, I'll go to the second question. But uh, Yannick and Caroline, if you want to add on this first question, I mean, go ahead. So uh, the question would be where should the should the museums or the institutions start if they want to develop a project? Or do you have any suggestion of best practices? So maybe I would start with uh, Yannick from Hello Creation. Thanks, Molando. Uh, one simple thing, call us at the beginning of the process. Too many times museums or clients, they contact us and they're already into it. And at some point when technology, no matter the format or, or, or the type of technology is involved, there are some issues to take into account. And calling us at the beginning of the process just to get a bit of input to challenge you on and making sure that you have clear goals, clear object, clear objective, making sure that you're uh, targeting the right uh, public. Uh, we'll be able within just an hour meeting to pinpoint some stuff. And at some point it's just the basic of a, of a long-term relationship where if we're there at the start, then you will do the right steps. And at, along the way uh, that doesn't involve much until you're ready to actually start a project. And of course, uh, we are aware that at some point, some of you are uh, going on to uh, tender out, uh, offers. So, but building that step and uh, getting a bit of consulting is gonna be time saving and money saving and a lot of less of headaches for you guys. So, and girls. Thanks, uh, Yannick. I will, I will, uh, I will keep on going with Caroline, and I might have a question to, just to keep on going on that one. So, Caroline, would you answer? Do you have an answer for this question, or any recommendations? We don't hear you, um, Caroline. We have for for any project, we have to ask ourselves what we want to say, what we want to relate to which public. And uh, to, to come back to the first question, if you want to reach new public, uh, then we have to imagine, we know that we live in a world of change, that the kids are born with the technology. So why uh, adapting, creating technology, I would say to reach them, but I would go further on and, and uh, creative technology, but with a gamification approach will engage them for, I will cite the researchers, uh, the researcher James Paul Guy, uh, in a, who said, present a, a kid a written book, a written text to a young people of today. It's like giving um, a game instruction booklet, booklet without the game itself. But then the instruction are difficult to read but the same content, the same text begin to be easier to read while playing a game because the content is association. It associate, is associated with images, actions, an experience, dialogues, emotions. So it's, it's the way uh, they, they grew up with the video game. They are used to do that to obtain feedback related to the success of their actions, to earn points, to choose their route according to their taste and personalize their experience, collaborate and compete with others. So 
if we just put ourselves in their shoes and imagine an experience for them, then you're going to attract uh, the, the, the new generation to your institution. Thanks, Karin. And I, we uh, have a question. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, um, go ahead, um, uh, Yannick. Oh, Manu, sorry. <laughs> go yeah, ahead. I just wanted to complement to those two answers. Yeah. I think also, don't forget your mission. Like, you already have content. Do not transform the nature of what you're already exhibiting. Start with what you're good at and use technology, use our experience, use our talent and, and everyone on this team, not me specifically, uh, to add value to it. You know, so don't start from scratch and all of a sudden create a mapping show when you're showing the arts of a painter. You know, try to just integrate it so that the star of your institution is still what you had before technology stepped in, I think is important. Quickly, Yannick, I think you wanted yeah. to add something, yeah? yeah. Yeah, two little things. I will spin on what Manny just said. First thing, never forget that the technology and the technical aspect is always in support to the actual message, content, art. So that's one mistake a lot of people do when they want to create something new to attract a new crowd is like, oh, what's the new gadget or what's the new technology and what can we do for it? And many times when you go back to the drawing table where you're making clear of your mission, your goals, target audience and everything, it will dictate at some point different kind of technology and technical aspect. And to what Karen was just saying uh, before, uh, in relation to the first question, I would make a parallel with the retail store. In retail store, sometimes you have a lost leader. That's something that attracts people, new people in. And even though they won't be making money out of it, once you get people into the store, they will buy something else. In the case of using technology nowadays, being in 2021, I think that technology is a win leader. It's it's the thing that will attract, but once they get into your place, then it's really your content and your 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 what you really want to tell your audience or teach or or uh, educate your audience that will be the most important thing. So see it like as a, a fish line, and the more efficient the fish line, the more crowd, the more new crowd you'll be attracting, and off and often you want to also uh, reach to the younger generation. They're into technology in every day. So we need to feed them with new crazy ideas, not the <laughs> usual iPads or phone because they're used to it. Thanks, uh, Yannick. And we have a question for the from the 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 uh, the, the public, well, the people that the institutions that are participating. So I'm just going to go with it. It's quite, it's a quick a technical, but very good question. So it's coming from Dominique from the New Brunswick Museum, I assume. So um, Dominique is asking if, uh, well, I'm just going to read the question. So I don't, uh, I don't, I don't mistake in, in what she's, or he's, or what the question is. Should we do, uh, should we do a call with you as advisory before the publication of a call of offer? or you prefer after the call, so it's more concrete for you uh, that the project is more on the table. So I'm, I might start with Caroline because I wanted to, I think you wanted to say something. So do you have an answer to this? Would you prefer to have uh, a chat before a call of proposal or after when you have more information? That's, that's a very good question. Um, in fact, uh, to, to, to com com continue what, what, we, what we were saying is that, um, the idea is not to put the technology uh, on the floor. The idea is to find the best mean, the best technology, the best approach for the content that we want to, uh, to develop. And this, this is not easy for an institution who don't really know what we can do with the technology. So for sure we can help uh, in, uh, in, in the beginning to find out how I can learn read out say, reading something, how I can learn by doing, how I can learn by, by moving, how I can learn by being involved in the experience and having an experience. So yeah, we can, uh, we can be a, a good counselor uh, right in the first step of the, in the beginning of your, your, your process, like Yannick Thanks. was saying. Great. Thanks, Caroline. Anyone of the speaker would like to add something? Yeah, Isabel? Uh, yeah, um, I personally love iteration because I've been working more than 15 years in technology, especially in in uh, innovation. And iteration is something that works very well. 
and you actually can do a part of it yourself. So then you do have some experience, first-hand experience before talking to any one of us. Like for example, uh, if you want to do a quest that uses technology, well, maybe te test just a paper one, just for fun, you know, a fast one done, you know, like with a, you know, like home printer, just to see it, just for a weekend, feel, feel the groove. Like for example, uh, uh, we, have a, we have a deployment this summer with uh, the Botanical Gardens of uh, New Brunswick. And they actually had a first system that used QR codes. And when you scan them, you know, on the signage, you could get, you know, like a few information. But then when she saw what we have, she said, oh my God, you guys are like, it's gonna be so much easier to deal with your system than ours because ours was homemade, etc." But they actually, I just love that. She knew exactly what it was, what it meant for her to deal with this kind of system. So actually in a few weeks, she's actually deploying super fast and sh she was really prescriptive. And then people like uh, Manu and Caroline and Yannick, they can come and add ideas and contents, but you guys are actually not like, you guys know, you feel it somehow inside, you're able to actually, you know, parameter like uh, uh, those guys, so they can do something magical with uh, the, your first experiment. Thanks, uh, Isabel. Uh, we have another question, so I, I'll go, I will through it, because uh, I think it's quite interesting to, to answer our public uh, public's question. So budget is a big uh, issue. Are you willing to work with groups on grant funding to facilitate these types of uh, projects? So yeah, Isabel, I, I guess that's a yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, if you allow me, Yannick, one, we, when we started with New Brunswick uh, uh, Botanical Gardens, she went to see her administration council and there were other people in there, like uh, Office Bureau of Edmundston. And they said, oh yeah, you wanna go in there. You know, let, let's, you know, like uh, mutualize together and have a huge experience in the city with the art center and all of that. So I really truly believe that uh, you guys should actually talk to each other and uh, learn from each other and actually help out each other with um, mutualizing for technology. Yeah, Nick, you wanted to add something? Yeah, uh, for projects that are not um, going through the call of proposal that uh, clients can uh, uh, hire us directly, we often do kind of preliminary design, preliminary budgeting and, and uh, work with the, the, the client in order for them to build their uh, case in order to go seek the funding they need. Um, the study case I will be uh, presenting later on is with the Quebec uh, Biodiversity Center. We started discussing this idea in 2015 and then did all the work and until they secured the financing and started that project in 2018. So it took three years, but along the way we were there as advisors, as designers, and we were doing presentation with them to the cities, to the funders and everything. And that's how we got to get that project uh, going on. So uh, yes, it's something uh, doable, uh, unless there's the call for proposal, which obviously puts everybody on the same on the same line, so. Great, thanks uh, Yannick. And maybe like just one last question that, and you partly answered it. And it's a question that I'm, I'm far from being specialized in, in museums or exhibitions, but I've been working with museum in my past experiences and I was, uh, surprise how long the exhibitions are planned ahead and it's like well for I, I will say like my experience was with institutions in Quebec and they were planning like four or five years ahead so when should they start talking to you in that process I mean is there a, a, a better time is it at the beginning beginning or in the middle or uh, yeah quickly uh, Yannick and I'll try to go with the others I will get back to my same answers as the second yeah. question the sooner the better uh sometimes it's just a little chat and it it, it draws the it draws the basic for the plan and then the museum or the client can work uh, quite a bit and then at some point uh there will be some touch base can be done with also not just one company don't hesitate to speak to all of us uh, we've done projects with Creo in the past. We've worked on similar project with uh, with My Smart Journey. Also, we haven't got a chance to work with troublemakers, but mm -hmm. for sure, Manu, we'll need to speak. Uh, there's a big <laughs> collaborative uh, uh, mentality in Quebec among the multimedia producers. So sometimes we end up being two, three, four companies all together to create something very extraordinary. Good. So, yeah. Thanks. And Manu, would you like to comment on that too? Uh, it's it's really just more of, of uh, yeah Nick's idea. Essentially, the sooner you you talk to us, 
because saying you want technology is very broad, right? And if you don't consult, you're going to write down an RFP, a request for proposal that will ask everything and its opposite. And budget will be sort of like shooting darts, a lot of darts through a wall, hoping that one hits the bullseye. So talk before coming up with the RFP with different creators to help you cater to what it is you're looking for. Have the, the, It'll help you develop the same language. And that way you can then create an RFP that, that fits to what exactly it is you're looking for and not be disserved. And I have no idea if that's a real word by, by an ambition that is not well steered, I would say. Thanks, uh, thanks, Manu. So that uh, brings us to the end of the second uh, part of our session this morning. So the third part, uh, we'll invite all four companies to talk to you uh, about a business case uh, that would be of interest for a cultural institution like uh, those that we have today. Um, and if you have question, again, you can try to put them in the chat and we'll see if we can uh, if we have time at the end to answer those otherwise our our team like Pierre and Anne Sophie uh, will will do the follow up with you so i'll start with uh, Isabel Lopez the founder and ceo of my smart uh, journey i was i was muted so um, i'm so sorry now i have to find back my 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 window here it is. There it is. So I'm going to show you two showcases super fast. Uh, we like to do technology for everyday use for museums. So this is an example of an exhibition called Fugitives that talks about slavery uh, in Quebec province. Yes, there were some slavery. So how they did do that? They actually took some newspapers uh, from the times where people were giving like a, uh, they were giving some cash if you 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 you, you, did, you did bring back the runaway slave and uh, how it works is that uh, artists did recreate uh, based on the description they recreate the, those uh, slaves uh, from uh, from uh, from the the history this uh, this exhibition did actually have an award and uh, it uh, it is very interesting because it, it treats about the subject is very difficult so that's why the the right of the of uh, the, the, the right of the person from Quebec decided to buy it to actually give it a very big tour the whole province you know schools museums you know like public spaces and uh, because the commissioner was a well-known uh, singer they they asked him to add some audios to it so he would use his own voice to tell the story about about Quebec province about uh, the history of Quebec province so it adds a great deal of value they also added quizzes they also decided to explain slavery a bit more uh, like a you know, like papers from the, the Times, you know, archive uh, documents, et cetera, et cetera. But, and uh, that's an example of quizzes because they wanted to have, um, they have, uh, for example, elementary school and uh, high school students coming. So they wanted it to be very interactive, uh, not as interactive as Creole can do, of course, but it is still like a, a way to interact uh, with them. So instead of having like paper that was, you know, like a uh, stick on the wall, there would be like some uh, interactive signage. But when the, muse the, the pandemic hit, the museum were closed, they really wanted to launch, they decided to do it virtually and something happened, something that would never happen in a museum. Actually 2000 people the first day did actually go and consult all the content. So they were pretty happy with it. So, and um, it, it's interesting because now, because of that, they're working on, for example, scholar tools that they can use within the black classroom. And they still have um, a, an exhibition that's really easy to, to move around because it's very lightweight. It's, uh, it's simple. So um, that's it. So that's the first example. And uh, what is interesting about that is that they could actually recuperate and be adapted to all the time. So uh, I, I like this idea of having this technology is so flexible. Another story is the Pointe à Calière Museum, which is a quite renowned museum in the center of, in the center of Montreal, and they have a, a temporary exhibition called Italian Montreal about uh, the history of the Italian uh, Italians coming to uh, in Quebec, and it's a very beautiful ex uh, ex exhibition. It has a lot of lent uh, materials coming from the community, and uh, those materials. Um, Sometimes you need to actually talk about it, and uh, they they want to tell the story completely. It's a very bit long for the signage, so they use our system not only for interaction and for making fun, but also for uh, putting all those extra contents that are for more passionate people, a bit less for the 
you know, like everyone, uh, 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 you know, a little family coming in. So uh, it's a great way to actually distillate the way of the, the, the public's first, you put something simple and light. And then if you want to know more, you can go further. Uh, so they do, uh, they did a bunch of quizzes. This one is about opera singers, for example, uh, and uh, the, 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 the signage is put uh, a bit everywhere. What you have to know is that Italians are still in Montreal. It's not like talking about the Mayas, you know, where they cannot really like argue about your choices as a museum for the exhibition. So they knew that the community would have an opinion about it. So they would want to correct stuff or, for example, they would say something is missing here. So they needed a system that was easy to actually add up content and change content easily so they could uh, like uh, satisfy everyone. So let's say there's a group saying you forgot to tell about this date. Well, they can add it on the on the system so that's why also they use the my smart journey and um it's a bit everywhere um i'm going fast because we have only seven minutes i really like this uh example. you still have uh, two three minutes it's oh good. my god i'm so fast today <laughs> uh so uh here you have a medal which is a fascist medal that encourages for having more kids i really like this one because uh it's just, it's a medal. So if you say to kids, you know, like, oh, or people, oh, it's a medal and you explain what it is. It is, yeah, it is there. It is, uh, uh, but uh, there's a principle as a guide. I have been a guide for a few years when I was uh, younger and you, you make fun, you know, you make jokes. And so for example, there you say, you know, how many kids do you think this woman had? So you say, oh, I'm counting the bows. There would, there was eight kids, you know? And then you say validate and then says, no, you get, you know, the medal for the first child. Oh my gosh, then it's nine. And you're like, oh, you tricked me. And at the same time, you're thinking, nine kids, that's a lot. You know, so it it does make, you know, it that it's a way to um automate somehow, you know, when you don't have enough, you know, like guides, or for example, when you know the guides are off, you know, it's their off day or you know, like in the lower season. So it's a great, it's a great way to actually give and uh, give some animation uh in a public space. So that was uh, the example in case my my gift didn't work and about pricing you know we're because there was a question um, about the pricing and how it went how it happened actually they they called they got an estimate they say go the next week they were starting and uh, most of them in a few, you know like in, in in italian montreal took them a month and a half because they were doing the content and uh, i showed you fugitive took them uh, two months because they were a lot of research they were to zero when they started uh, but it goes we can go quite fast we have a few museums who did a completely temporary exhibition in two or three weeks and uh, as i told you we really want to be affordable for you uh, this is like a my life mission you know like let's make my technology for everyone so uh, we have a lot of small museums we do have also big clients like air canada uh, cbc or you know like uh, big huge fine art museums but uh, i think it's still you know everyone should have it so that's my presentation thanks uh, isabel for this uh, very passionate uh, presentation uh we'll uh, keep on going with uh, manu uh, alberola producer at troublemakers manu yes hi i'll start by sharing the screen just a second here Uh, I'm not sure you're seeing the right screen. You're seeing the commentators notice, all right? Are you seeing the main, yeah, you're seeing the main page, right? Yeah, the, it's written the living okay. mosaic cultures of the New Brunswick Botanical Garden. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I'm going to run very quickly because initially my escalator pitch was also in my presentation. So the first few pages uh, are just beauty shots for your eyes. Uh, I'll hurry. I'll hurry up and I'll start here. So uh, today I'm here to present to you an ongoing project um, that Isabel knows about because she's also working with them. It's for the New Brunswick Botanical Garden. And I wanted to present it to you because I, I think it features this custom-made approach that we value for each of our clients. Um, I'll start by describing very quickly the garden. It, it is located, for those of you who don't know it, I know that I'm addressing to uh, people that might too. It's located close to Edmonston. It's mainly being a garden. It's an outdoors institution. Therefore, it's mostly open during the summer. It's a big 
tourist attraction around Edmonton and the main visitors uh, outside of uh, New Brunswick are coming from Maine, Quebec and Ontario. Uh, now the project inception uh, coming from José Landry, the general manager of the garden, came from this COVID reality. So last year she lost more than 50% of her visitors. And so she was trying to think uh, what type of experience can I uh, develop in order to add value and that could implement within the existing offer. And again, we're circling around something that I, I mentioned earlier on. Um, so we sat down and we started an analysis of the needs. Now, obviously what's interesting about the project is that it's a project that sort of was born because of COVID reality, meaning this reality is anchoring the needs of the project. Uh, there's obviously at first a desire for it to be contactless, uh, a very strong demand for the project to attract the local tourists because the borders are still closed. We do not know when it will be open. So there was a, a desire to add value for local tourists to come and visit and obviously be budget conscious, uh, something that respect a tough year, uh, inevitably. But then on top of that, there's some specific needs that needs to be addressed regarding a botanical garden. First of all, you're dealing with living organisms. So it means that whatever you integrate, it has to integrate without damaging nature, the plants. Uh, and finally, there was a specific need that it can be hard for us it's a daytime experience, which means no lighting, no mapping, uh, which sometimes no screens, which sometimes in our universe is hard because we rely on it to uh, translate a message. But the garden closes at five or at six and the sun is still up. So that was the specific needs. And we strategized uh, a solution taking into consideration these needs, turning them into guidelines, but really our process uh, lies on something that Jose said very early on. She said, the Mosaic Culture Exhibition is the garden's most successful event of the regular season. So right off the bat, uh, for the uninitiated, uh, Mosaic Culture is the, I'm gonna read here, horticultural art of creating giant sculptures using thousands of annual bedding plants to carpet steel forms. Sculptures made of plants, essentially, in a nutshell. And they exhibit seven to eight different sculptures per summer. Most of them are realistic recreations. So a horse, a peacock, a gardener, and they're placed all over the garden, uh, which invites, it's interesting because it invites the visitor, obviously, to walk and discover the garden. And this year, they selected these eight sculptures that you can see um, on the slide. And we had initially imagined experiences for each of the eight experiences, but for budget conscious reasons, we narrowed it down to eight and we proposed a build as you grow approach. So essentially first summer, let's focus on four. Following summer, we'll do four extra and that way all of a sudden you have eight. On our end, the challenge means we have to consider technology that is flexible in terms of reconfiguration. And obviously that can adapt and easily integrate within the sculpture regardless of shape. Uh, I thought I'd describe the, uh, the, the, the four ones that we selected to give you an idea, because since it's an in project, in production project, I don't have beauty shots. We're doing it right now. We're doing some tests as we speak right now. Uh, so the first one is the bison. The bison is interesting because he's massive, uh, very realistic. So we thought let's add to that realism. We hid some speakers close to the mouth and near the hooves with some uh, subwoofers from for low end. And now all of a sudden, out of nowhere, every now and then he's gonna grunt. Uh, you're gonna hear some footsteps as if he was walking. You're gonna hear him eat some dry uh, grass. Uh, Jose told us that often visitors will get close and take selfies. So we're like, there's a moment for a comedic effect here. There's a sensor, imagine taking a selfie and all of a sudden he sneezes, and there's a mist of water that attacks you. So there's a small palm and is going to happen every now and then when he gets close Manu, to it. Just, uh, uh, ben, yeah. just, en fait, Two les minutes. gens se lèvent. Non, non, en fait, c'est parce que est-ce que les images doivent changer ou si parce que là c'est statique ce qu'on a. Is, les, it, is it static or is it? Les images doivent changer. Okay, it's, it's no, not. No, the images uh, yeah. are. So we only have the so like. Right now, you're... But you can't. You, you talk so well. My yeah. imagination that's <laughs> wild. <laughs> All right. I was I was unsure, uh, but. Okay. But anyway, maybe like uh, we can we can send if 
the presentation to all the participants uh, afterwards. So if if you if we have it, okay. It's super stressing because I see my timer and now I'm at five <laughs> minutes thirty five seconds. Uh, so instead of trying to fix it, I'll I guess I'll finish yeah. and I'll send it to you and you'll be able to share it with you. Uh, we also have there's a the, there's a peacock. So the peacock is, is close to the cafe which means sometimes you go to, to a cafe to relax, obviously. So we couldn't be too interactive. We couldn't be too aggressive with the sound. I designed, uh, I thought about some, I'm, I'm from Panama. So I thought, let's create a universe, a soundscape that makes you feel like you're, you're in a cafe, but in a Southern country. So often there's life around you, but you don't see it, you hear it. There's movement, there's a, a bird song, there's a leaves on the floor and animals walking around it and the dry leaves will crackle. So that was for the, be the peacock that you can see, I'm learning now. <laughs> and, um, and you would have, I guess, to conclude soon. So I can give you 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, you're the best. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll skip. This has really thrown my vibe. Um, there's two more installation. I won't go over them, but essentially what I wanted to focus on, on top of custom made approach, it's also what I said earlier, focus on what you have, what you're already exhibiting and ask yourself how it, can we complement it? So I know my smart journey is also adding some boards all over the garden. That's a great way to add extra information to, to the beauty of the garden. We're creating these small moments of happiness here and there. So it's always start with what you have and then complement, add something that will simply integrate seamlessly. And I think the key word, and I'm done with this, is most of the technology we've presented in here, you can't see. You do not see the speakers. They're hidden. And that's, I think, the best way to integrate technology to experiences. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Manu. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure uh, to share the presentation with all the participants because I'm sure it's really yeah. worth uh, and apologies. Seeing apologies for that. and hearing. So I'll move quickly to Caroline Julien, founder and uh, head of the of uh, CREO. Okay. Um, I will just share. Okay. Not this. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yes? Okay, perfect. And if I change the screen, you're seeing everything? Perfect, excellent. Uh, and I will put this uh, there. So, um, as I was saying, Creo, uh, we have the ambition to uh, reinvent learning. Uh, let me see if I can, sorry about that, uh, okay to reinvent learning. Um, so to do this, we create memorable experience that uh, give the pleasure of learning um, using a playful and technological approach. So the, what we're, you're seeing actually is uh, the exhibition uh, Ingenious Ingenuity. We have co-developed with partners uh, for the, uh, the Science Center of Montreal, um, where uh, the, the kids uh, have to um, we, um, where, where we use our expertise in scientific uh, communication, our creativity to imagine uh, meaningful uh, digital devices which enable the old body and senses. So today I will present you um, how we use uh, tech projection technology in different projects to uh, have an immersive, fun and social experience. So here uh, in Ingenious Ingenuity, um, the young people have to fish uh, virtual salmons on a uh, river projected, on, projected onto the ground with a connected harpoon. So while playing, the children learn without reading long text on the panel, they discover the native culture of Canada. On the same exhibition, we also use interactive floor and walls combined with connected objects. Uh, so here, the cubes, uh, um, on uh, the floor, we have a, an interactive uh, floor um, where you see cubes. Each cube uh, represents a trap and the kids have to catch the right animal with the right trap with the written and visual cues on the cube. And when they have the correct association, the animated track disappears. 
So the, 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 this exhibition uh, has won a Numix Award by the Digital Industry of Quebec and a Cascade Award, Best Canadian Interactive Exhibition, Large Institution Category, awarded by the Canadian Science Centre Association. It's a, an exhibition budget of around $1, $1 million. But then we ask ourselves, could we use the projection technology in an educational program, not just for a big exhibition project? So with the, the Museum Pop of Trois-Rivières, we have developed a mobile furniture which could transform any floor in a touch screen. This permit to develop a very fun and educational multiplayer game. Here, the player have to associate a, problem, a problematic with an invention and its inventor. It's multiplayer, it's, it's very fun, it's worked very well, so well that we have a difficulty to find a spot in the calendar to integrate new games because it's always on school, which uh, there's a lot of demand for this and the museum is very happy. Um, so if it's interesting for your institution, we have the intellectual property on this project so we could resell and adapt uh, to the game to your content. It's a budget less than $100,000. Um, but so that kind of project make us very fan of immersive technology, with, which leads us to an important collaboration with the Aquarium Tropical du Palais de la Porte Dorée in Paris, France, Omega Ceta. Here the public dive into an immersive interactive adventure for a close encounter with the most fascinating and largest mammals uh, of the planet. So it's an innovative, cutting edge, cutting edge uh, experience that reinvent science museology and learning to draw new audiences. In Paris, our clients wanted to an immersive experience without the need of a VR headset. So we are using smart cameras, which allows visitors to interact with fishes or the giant of the seas without touching anything, without touching a screen, without touching another visitor. So it's a great post-COVID-19 solution. One we, minute. Okay. Yeah, so life-size projection um, uh, of uh, marine mammals uh, in a spectacular visual production, projection on a 15 wall long, photorealistic uh, 3D with organic animation that uh, has been truthfully validated by a scientific committee. Uh, very happy to uh, put on this uh, the, the sound of, uh, of Manu and, and, and his team. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, no whale were abused to create this uh, experience. It's a solution that solved ethical issues association with keeping marine mammals in captivity. It's, play, it's a playful experience. It's in real time. You play a role in the marine environment and simply observe, which will just change your mood. Or uh, being a, a school of hearing, you have to move to attract fishes. You can attract 500, 1,000, 50 fish, then the whales begin to appear. And when you have, you have move enough to have 100,000 fishes, then you have to, the, the chance to see how humpback whales are eating. Uh, it's very impressive. Not a lot of fish here than what you'll see on the real, uh, on the wall. Uh, it was our first uh, shot. So, um, We'd like Conclude. to see if uh, you want to <laughs> swim with us. Um, actually, we are working uh, with uh, these partners to do uh, the first port all format. It's uh, the initial version that will evolve with the public throughout the whole year. But we are already searching for uh, partners for the next step of the project. Caroline, uh, you would have to conclude. OK. If and I say, want to be fair. <laughs> OK, yeah, just to say that uh, we, are up, we have uh, financing uh, with Canadian Media Fund for that. So it's a good opportunity uh, for you to, to be part of an innovative experience uh, with uh, less budget that it, will, it would cost to do it alone. So very Thanks. happy. Thanks.
Thanks, yeah. Caroline. Very, very interesting. And I'll, I'll uh, rapidly go to Yannick Donet, our last speaker uh, from Allo Creation for seven minutes. Thanks. Yannick. Yep, I will share my screen. So, do you see it? Yeah, we see Allo Creation. Yeah, and it's moving to Quebec Biodiversity Center, raising biodiversity. Yeah, I'm just going to start back. Good. All right. So, uh, for a case study, um, basically, this story started in 2015, where we just delivered a fully immersive and interactive room at the Quebec Biodiversity Center. At this time, we were mostly focused on providing audiovisual and multimedia services and design. And the next project that was discussed, discussed with the Quebec Biodiversity Center uh, was a great opportunity for us to develop our own um, technology, interactive, fully inter inter interactive technology. And it all started uh, by walking in the adjacent forest at the center with the director and 2015 was a special year because this was the year where Moment Factory released their first Foresta Lumina experience and everybody was going crazy over it. Um, the, it was a, quite a, a success, but um, people, some people wanted an alternative to the Lumina and that was the case of the Quebec Biodiversity Center. So if we start uh, focusing on what were their needs, Basically, the mission of the Quebec Biodiversity Center is to raise biodiversity awareness uh, in general. In this case, they wanted to use the forest and they wanted to extend business hours with a nighttime activity because they were uh, mostly influenced by the success that Lumina was, was generating uh, a couple hundred kilometers uh, away. Um, this was an opportunity for them to generate a new revenue stream, and they wanted something mostly focused on entertainment, but they were they wanted to create scientific content within the premises, and they wanted, of course, a different experience. So we sat down and we thought, how can we do it? And also at that time, the adjacent forest was a protected zone. So for us, that meant no electricity, no digging, fully respecting the forest. So that was quite a challenge. So we thought, what if the, so if the forest could speak to us? So that was the next step. And that's how Echoes of Origin uh, was brought up. And basically, it's uh, an adventure outdoor in this case, but it's, it's indoor and outdoor because it starts in a building where you get a couple of indication, then there's a, 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 a film to put the uh, introduction to the experience and then you're just thrown out in the forest with a very powerful and reliable technology and you get to experience this uh this adventure in the meantime this project started the idea was creating in 2015 the the quebec the biters center had to finance we started developing the technology we started pushing the concept and we got along the way, some surprises like, oh, finally, we can put some electricity close to the path. Uh, oh, finally, we can do some intervention, some installation into the forest. So as the project was getting uh, created, uh, opportunity were opening up to us to create something bigger, more exciting, and even more interactive. So the concept basically is combining storytelling a, a fully interactive experience where you get the people to participate, to be active actors of their experience, and you put the gaming into play to create this big emotion. So we send the people exploring the forest at night and the intent, the, the first initial idea is remember when you were a kid and you were going camping the first time and the nighttime comes and there's the fire, fire, uh, fire uh, going on and then you decide to pick up your lamp, torch lamp, and you go exploring the wood. All the scenarios that are in your head, cracking in the forest, you get scared. So by tapping into that childhood memory and experience, we wanted to bring it that to the next level where people would go in the forest and relive that same excitement, but also 
discover what's in that forest. And the particularity of this forest is that it's very, uh, uh, it has a lot of biodiversity in itself. It's a very rich forest and that's why it's a protected zone. So we got the people to dis discover it. And uh, the main team was uh, discovering the Champlain Sea uh, heritage where before the St. Lawrence Valley, Champlain Sea was covering all the region and that created a rich soil, rich vegetation, and a lot of, of uh, particularities in that region. So the next step was by bringing people into the forest, how can we guide them? So we create a character, which is very mischievous and serious at the same time. And it really uh, follows you through the whole experience from the beginning to the end. Basically, Echoes of Origin is 20 multimedia station to discover along a 1.8 kilometer pathway. It takes about 75 to 90 minutes, sometime a bit longer to uh, experiment. It's for all age. It's available in French and English. And it basically also it's upgradable because uh, the, the center wanted a project that could be um, uh, bonified uh, over the year. So every year there's something new and we're adapting and also getting the feedback from the uh, from the visitors and always making adjustment with the technology with the storyline with the interactivity and also with the the decors the technology in itself a very special branch in this case this is a connected object and flare is the system we have developed and basically this is what we produce for the echoes of origin. But if we go to the basic, it's all in a tube. So we can basically shape it into whatever form we want. And we could also make it into any, any other format. It could be a box, it could be a medallion whatsoever. And what's very uh, special about this technology is it's one last, three uh, Yannick, just one last minute. Okay, it's a three directional technology that allows people to interact with each other. They can control the installation and they react to the installation. So that allows a lot of gaming process. And it's really uh, exciting because people are in charge of their experience. A couple of picture of things that were created along the way where people explore and there's so there's big mapping, there's uh, those arch uh, game with the flowers where you're doing color matching as you were a bees, et cetera, et cetera. I will go a bit faster for the stats season one 2018 it opened in august we got 18,000 visitors over two months the satisfaction level was 96.4 percent it was closed in 2020 due to covid 19 but since this is an activity that can be done in small group because they re were releasing every five minute a group from two to twelve person then it's very COVID friendly for this year because families will be able to do it and it's opening next June 24th. And this year we're expecting 25,000 visitors over a four month period. But the capacity of this system at Becanco is more than 100,000 visitors a year. And now we're, try we're working to expand the technology to go with really higher numbers um, for uh, bigger sites. This project has, been, uh, has got two awards, one with the Quebec so uh, Museum Society and also with the original tourism uh, uh, um, uh, society uh, in the center of Quebec. Flare, it's fully, con the concept and design is fully custom customizable. It's a scalable, it's, it has already multiple multimedia gaming engine. It's a budget that starts with 1.5 million and up. I know it's a big project. We do smaller things too. And the lead time is about eight to 18 months to create a full experience. Feel free to reach me. This is a quick list of museums we're working with at this time or in the past uh, one or two year, but we've worked with over hundred museums, a hundred museums uh, over the time. Uh, we've been in business since 2005. Thanks, thanks, Yannick. Thank Very interesting presentation again. And it, it seems to me that there is no limit to what we can do of any exhibitions. It's really uh, interesting. Um, this brings us to the end of our session today. Um, I don't see the chat 
that uh, section. So I think there was a question. I would have liked to have a quick look on it. I don't know, and Sophie or Pierre, if I can have again the chat section. Otherwise, for those of you who are on a tight schedule and need to leave us, thanks for being here today. Um, I hope the session was of interest to you. As I said, oh, here is the chat, chat question. So I'm just going to have a quick look. Uh, wow. Um, Okay, well, I don't see any, well, there's, the chat seems to have been very active, so I might not grow, go through all this. I, our team, like Pierre and Anne-Sophie, will go through all this and we'll take any question that wouldn't have been uh, answered and do the follow-up with all of the uh, four companies and our guest uh, institution today. So, as I was saying, Thanks again uh, for uh, all the institutions and museums that uh, registered today. It was uh, nice having you and I hope it was nice for you to hear uh, the, the product and services that are offered by those four uh, very innovative companies that we have in Quebec. Um, I would like again to say that uh, Pierre that has just uh, opened its camera will be uh, doing the follow up with you. We'll send you emails with the presentations and all the coordinates of the people that you need to have um and uh yeah um is there anything i should say pierre i think we have been able well we're 10 minutes off a schedule so i'm sorry this is my fault but i i think it was really interesting so thanks uh yeah pierre you seem to want to say something well uh, uh, see if there's an organization that would like to ask a question to the panelists so we can take a few question extra question if it's okay. If not, then I will communicate with everyone to make a follow up regarding uh, the experience that you had today. And perhaps we can uh, facilitate the meetings with uh, all those panelists. Thank you. So any questions? Well, I guess uh, that will be it. As I say, like uh, as I said, as we said, um, Pierre uh, will be the the link between all of uh, all of you. So thanks everybody. Thanks uh, for being today, and hopefully we we'll see nice partnerships uh, emerging from this uh, meeting today. And have a great uh, week and be safe. Thank you, Maud Andre. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.